Hey guys, welcome to Full Stop Reviews, your one-stop shop for all things movies. Now, for today's review, we're, we will be continuing our look at the Criterion Collection. I wanted to do, as I said in the previous video, a look at different movies from pretty much around the world. So today we're going to be doing a movie that's in Spanish, hailing from the countries of, well, it's a dual Mexican-Spanish production. And if you've clicked on the thumbnail, if you saw the thumbnail, you know what this movie is. Pan's Labyrinth, or... Oh, en español se llama El Labrinto del Fono. This movie's one of the best movies ever made. I know I say that a lot, but it's true. <laughs> I mean, green light. All right, stop the review. No, I'm... Okay. So, fun fact about this movie. The Spanish name of the film uh, El Labrinto del Fono doesn't translate to the same thing in English. Pan's Labyrinth implies a relation to the Greek god Pan, which was not what was featured in this movie. And Del Toro has even said that there's not really supposed to be a parallel there, um, despite the fact that they're both fonts in the movie. <laughs> and the Spanish language title has more of a distinction because it translates to Labyrinth of the Fawn. The other fun fact I have about this movie is that the man who plays the Fawn, uh, Doug Jones, didn't speak a word of Spanish when he was cast in the movie, and he was horrified to find out that the movie wasn't in English. And Del Toro basically had to beg him to stay in the production, and he did, and oh my god, is it a good thing he did, because he knocks it out of the park. The rest of the cast is rounded out by Sergei Lopez as the captain and Ophelia's stepfather, and Ivana Paquero as Ophelia herself. Now, there's also kind of another parallel, and I, upon my research for the film, I couldn't tell if this was intentional or not, but the naming of Ophelia, despite the fact that it's not spelled the same way, recalls, well, Hamlet, that Ophelia. And so I think there's a, I think the parallel is supposed to be there, but I wasn't able to find any confirmation about that, but hey, death of the author. And so this movie is kind of the peak of the dark fantasy gothic aesthetic that Del Toro set out to establish, and many would argue he actually achieves that aesthetic way better in his Spanish language movies like Kronos or The Devil's Backbone and Here than he does in some of his English language movies, which is kind of an interesting uh, dynamic, if you ask me. Also, it's a totally subjective one. This movie balances a lot of different tonal elements because it's a war movie. It's fantasy. It's high fantasy, but it's, it's also dark fantasy. Not many filmmakers could pull off that kind of tonal shifting that a movie like this has to have, but it's a very, very cohesive story. It's a very cohesive movie. My final fun fact about this is that there was actually supposed to have been a sequel to this. In November 2007, Del Toro has stated that he's working on a sequel called 3993, and decided to can the project and went with Hellboy 2 instead. So the movie is about a young girl and her mother who move in with their new stepfather. This movie is kind of also about the early days of the Francoise regime of Spain because it's set about five years after the end of the Spanish Civil War, summer 1944. I believe there's even a scene where they talk about the Allies landing in Normandy, so it would put it right around June-ish, 1944, maybe a little bit later. So the movie's kind of subtextually about the transformation of Spain as fascism had more of a stranglehold on the country, but it's also dealing with the last remaining holdouts from the Spanish Civil War. Um, interestingly enough, there's kind of it's kind of a spiritual successor to The Devil's Backbone, which dealt with the final days of the Spanish Civil War where the Republicans were defeated by the fascists at the very end. And so there's kind of like a thematic continuation from here to there. So this movie can be interpreted in a lot of different ways. Some people are convinced that the fantasy aspects of this movie, the labyrinth, the pale man, the fawn, that they're just elements of Ophelia's imagination as she struggles to cope with the trauma and horror that is happening around her between the abusive stepfather, the fact that her country has been destroyed, her father's dead, her, her mother is dying, her mother's also pregnant at the same time, and there is still warfare going on around her. And so these scenes are juxtaposed pretty heavily with the scenes in the labyrinth, quote unquote. There are others who are convinced that it's real and that the, the choices that she makes in this movie end up giving her the reward of being able to go back to that kingdom. I don't 
entirely know this might be a death of the author situation. The movie seems to imply that it goes one way. The director has also stated that the, that it's supposed to be read a certain way. I'm also kind of of the opinion that simply writing anything fantastical in movies off as a product, product of a character's imagination is kind of lazy. It kind of makes sense here because it, the, the fantasy elements are used as a coping mechanism. And so as Ophelia is going on her own journey there, the other characters are dealing with much more real world problems. They don't have the luxury of being able to escape that the way that she can. And the movie kind of puts that front and center too. And so the first time I saw this, I was surprised as to how many different storylines there are going on and how well they mesh together. And the acting is just amazing. The acting and the directing. I think one of the hardest things to do for a director or for any movie production um, is to get good performances out of child actors. It's not an easy thing to do. And Ivana Baccaro, who plays Ophelia, I am so sorry if I mispronounced your name. She knocks it out of the park. She's so good. And that's, she was like 11 when that movie was shot. That's, that's, that's damn impressive. The rest of the cast is really good. I mean, hell, you had one, as I already mentioned, who didn't even know the language he was speaking as he was acting. <laughs> and you you have another, you, you just, like, everybody does so good in this movie. Guys, just watch this movie. Watch it. It's a green light. One of the disappointing things about this particular review show being that I try to keep it around 10 minutes is that within the confines of review, of a review, I can't really go in depth too much with analysis because there's so much to talk about this movie that it feels almost, I feel like I'm almost cheating the audience and myself by just cutting the review off here. It's one of the best Spanish language movies of all time. It's one of the best fantasy movies of all time. One of the better war movies of all time. I wouldn't really say that the war is kind of more secondary, so I don't know how you, if you would classify it as a war movie. I have one more Criterion movie coming up next week. I won't be as cheery when I'm talking about that one. I won't spoil what I'm going to talk about, but it is also yet another film set during the Second World War, if noticing a pattern here. We also have first timers on this channel where my friends and I torture each other by making each other watch bad movies for your amusement, so you damn well better appreciate it. And just, like, let me know your thoughts on these videos. I, I want to hear from you guys. That's all the time we have today, and as always, it's Full Stop Reviews.